move on. Um, I think we should make a start. And I'd like to begin by asking you a question. How many of you have moved house in the last 15 years? Can I have a show of hands? Most of you, good. Now, does any of you know the last time our organisation moved? Any guesses? About 20 years ago? That's right, 21 years ago. Now, I know most of you already, but for those of you I don't know and haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm Steve Parker and I'm in charge of the office move. And before well, moving here, I was responsible for the setting up of our new branch in France. I'm here today to tell you and explain about the office move and to answer any questions that you may have, so please do feel free to interrupt me at any point. My presentation will last about 20 minutes and I have some handouts here that I've prepared that I will distribute at the end. Right. Well, I've divided my presentation into four parts. Why, where, when and who. And I hope to be able to clear away some of this cloud of smoke before the end of my presentation. First of all then, why? Why did you, why does anyone, move house? So to sum up, what is change? We can see that change is normal. It's natural. It's happening all around us. So why do people resist it? And that leads me to my second point. How to prepare for change. And I must stress that without this essential planning stage, no change project will ever succeed. It's a bit like an iceberg. What you can see is the implementation phase, but what is below the water is all the planning and preparation. Change needs commitment. Commitment from all levels, from top to bottom. If you don't have this commitment, if you haven't created the conditions for this commitment to thrive and grow, then no change management system will work. There are quite a few experts in this field. Rosabeth Moss Cantor, who's a Harvard professor, is perhaps the, the best known of these. She's come up with a list, a top ten, if you like, of rules for successful change. The whole list can be summarized by step back and examine what you have in your organization. What's good, what can be improved, what's missing, Get commitment through a shared vision, mission statements, discussions, etc. Plan the change and implementation structure and then reinforce the fact that change is just a part of working. Is everybody with me? Does anyone have any questions? I'd like to turn to where we're moving to. Have a look at this transparency. This shows the site of our new building and just to help you situate it, here is the city centre and here the motorway exit. The new building is further from the city centre but closer to the motorway. Now let's have a look at our new home. Sorry, wrong slide. Ah, uh, oh, here it is. Now, as you can see, it is a very big modern building, and this means that it has the following advantages. Firstly, more space. Our present building has about 4,000 square metres. 
And our new one will have around 5,800 square metres. That's an increase of 45%. The car park will be bigger as well, and so everyone will have a parking spot. Secondly, lower running costs. Although it is bigger, the fact that it's a recent construction means that heating and maintenance costs are lower. Thirdly, we'll have our own canteen. And finally, for those of you who are health conscious, special reduce rates at the sports centre down the road. We've looked at what change is, how to prepare for change, and now for the third and final part of my presentation, we're going to look at how to implement that change, or making it happen. Here there are two main factors, communication and commitment. You often hear two complaints in large organizations. The first one is, nobody told me. The second one is, nobody asked me. Communication is essential, and a senior manager should be put in charge of ensuring that this gets done. Everything should be communicated by the best means possible to stop rumors and misinformation spreading. The second factor is commitment. Change projects that do not have executive commitment fail. Change projects that do not have staff commitment fail. Change projects that have commitment, that everyone has bought into, have a reasonable chance of success. Have a look at this. Without communication and commitment, you end up with this. To increase the chances of success, create a team, a change team. This should include at very least, one senior executive, a full-time project manager, and outside consultants. This dedicated team can make a great difference to the success of the project. Now, the major problem you will face is resistance. And this can be a... And so the accounts department will be on the first floor on the south side which should bring a little bit of sunshine into their work. So, to sum up, I've explained why we have to move, where we'll be moving to, when we expect the move to take place and who will be moving where. And in conclusion, I'd just like to say that the success of an operation like this depends on timing and cooperation. Timing because so many things depend on other things. And if just one thing isn't ready or isn't on schedule, then everything else is delayed. And delays don't just cost us in financial terms, but also in human terms. Nobody likes to be kept waiting. Cooperation, because if we don't ensure that the office is running efficiently during the month of the move, then our customers won't get the service that they're used to. I hope that your future, as far as the office move is concerned, is now a little bit clearer. Thank you. And if you have any more questions, uh, I'm very happy to answer them, if I can. So, to sum up, today we've looked at what is change, how to prepare for change, analyze, design, and plan, and finally, making it happen or the implementation of the change program. In conclusion, I would recommend to you that you do not embark on any change program unless you are willing to invest in the steps I've outlined to you in my presentation today. Thank you, and if you have any comments or questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them.
Mr. Hill. Could you explain a little more about overcoming resistance to change? Certainly. There are different levels of resistance, and these levels do then change in time. At first, a very common attitude is a negative one. Change is something different. Most people feel threatened by it. They need reassurance. They need to see that their managers are 100% behind the change, that this change is possible. And then most people will follow. The rule is communicate, communicate, and communicate at every stage. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, I have two questions. Firstly, well, what happens if the plan fails? And secondly, what time span, in your experience, should we expect in an organization of our size? Well, uh, perhaps I, I can answer the second question first. The time frame does depend on, on two factors. Firstly, the resources earmarked for the project. And secondly, senior management commitment. Now, in my experience, a project of this size could take anywhere between three and five years. Your first question is rather more difficult to answer, as that would depend on what you would accept as a success and what you would consider to be a failure. And that's really the subject of a whole other presentation. And as we have rather limited time today, I'd rather not get into that at the moment. Any other questions? Um, yes, I found your presentation very informative, um, but I didn't really think that it addressed some of the major staff difficulties, uh, challenges that I think our organisation will face when we decide to go ahead with our change programme. You see, there are some members of staff who are just lazy, unproductive, disruptive even, um, and they will resist, as they always do, any kind of change. Basically, they're just waiting for their retirement, as I think they have been doing since the day they started working. Um, I've got some of them in my department. Um, it's absolutely impossible. You ask them to do something and they will do absolutely anything they can to avoid doing it. I mean, how do you work with people like that? And how do you expect such an ambitious project to succeed? Uh, Sorry, you, you can I, can I um, just interrupt you there? What you're asking, if I understood you correctly, is how does an organization deal with a disruptive element in the workforce? Is that correct? Yes. Well, this tends to be a minority, a vociferous minority, but a minority nevertheless that tends to react against any change. So it's not really this change that they're reacting against. And I think this is something that you should keep in mind when you're dealing with them. Does anyone else have any solutions as to how to deal with this particular group of people? Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, oh, pity, pity to it that we're uh, stuck in here on oh, such a sunny day. Um, uh, yeah. But, but uh, I've been asked uh, to give this talk on effective presentations because, as most of you are probably aware, I've recently been on a training course and uh, uh, the, boss, uh, the boss thought it would be a good idea if I were to come here uh, and pass on to you uh, what I've learned so that you will be able to make better presentations. Uh, now it shouldn't take too long and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you won't find it uh, too boring. <laughs> Right, well, I'd like to start, if I may, with a, with a brief outline of my talk. Um, I've got it here somewhere, hold on, um, just a second. 
Ah, yeah, here it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, right, now, the first point I'd like to make is that you have to prepare properly. Now, as you can see, I have got all of my notes prepared here, so uh, we shouldn't have a problem with that. So, first lesson, preparation is the key. Now, yes, uh, me. can I ask a question? Sorry. So, sorry, can you possibly keep questions to the end? Otherwise, I'm simply never going to get through all this. All right. Nevertheless, the attention span of a typical audience is 15 to 20 minutes. In addition, the research, which incidentally was carried out in Europe and North America, and thus makes no claims for other cultures, clearly demonstrates the primacy and recency effect. Consequently, one is obliged to conclude that most of what is said in the middle of a presentation is not retained by the audience. The conclusion one draws, therefore, is that to ensure the audience's retention of material, one should reiterate one's main points frequently. There are, however, other variables which should be taken into account at this juncture. A major... Uh, a ma a major impalement? No. Uh, a major impatience? No. Uh, oh, it must be a major impediment. Yes. So sorry. Yes, that's it. A major impediment to effective communication is the... Uh, right. Now, um, I've got some interesting statistics on this overhead transparency. Um, so, I'll... Uh, uh, right. Doesn't seem to be working. Uh, always check it's plugged in. <laughs> ah, right, there we are. Right, now, what these... Ah, oh, sorry. Um, perhaps to the best of us. Um, oh, no, hang on. Um, ah, there we are. Right, now, I'll just try and refocus it. Sorry about this, I should have checked this before. Right. Good, there we are. Now, these statistics are from a survey. Now, what they basically show sorry, is... Sorry, but I can't see it. So, sorry, well, you can't read it at the back. Um, right, I'll, I'll try and make it a bit bigger. Um, uh, uh, right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out for you then. All right. Um, Right, now, this is a survey of the worst fears of 3,000 US inhabitants. Uh, speaking before a group, 40%. Bugs and spiders, 10%. I'd now like to turn to cross-cultural presentations. In other words, what issues should you consider when presenting to people from another country? Perhaps the most important issue here, being British, is that of humour. When we look at other cultures, we see that humour, during a presentation, is not so universally appreciated as we may have thought. In many cultures, humour, in a working environment, is perceived as frivolous, not serious. So it may be counterproductive to use too much humour. The key is to get to know as much as possible about the other culture before your presentation, and if you can't... So, a clear message is important, especially for the end, or the conclusion. Right, well, uh, that's about it. I think I've, I've just about covered everything I've learnt about uh, presentations. Um, I'll, I'll just check my notes, hold on. Oh, yeah! Sorry, yeah, there is just one thing. I haven't covered. Um, the language you use. Uh, try not to use formal words because formality does not help us to communicate effectively. Good. It's finished. Uh, I'm glad I remembered to say that. Uh, and now I have definitely finished. A bit late. Uh, I'm sorry you all had to miss your lunch hour. Still, well, uh, thanks very much. Um, excuse me. Oh, sorry, yes, you had a question? Yes, I have two, in fact. What surprises me, or one thing that surprised me in your presentation today, was the amount of time you say is necessary for the preparation of a good presentation. Uh-huh. This seems to me to be totally unrealistic, in that for the majority of us here, we just don't have that sort of time at our disposal. And I'd also like to know something about electronic presentations. 
Yeah, well, I think that electronic presentations in today's marketplace are a necessity. Good, right, any more questions? No, right, well, thanks very much. You didn't answer my first question. What was it again? 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 Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Arkham's new training facility in Waterbeach in Cambridge. In this presentation, we're going to be reviewing the new products which Arkham is about to launch, and I hope to show you how these products can contribute to a continuous profit stream for you and your businesses. 20 years ago, we launched the first A&R Cambridge product, and you can see here the original A60 amplifier. This project was designed and manufactured by John Dawson and Chris Evans. John is today the managing director of Arcam and is still heavily involved in the design and manufacturing process for our modern equipment. In those days, 1976, both of the gentlemen who produced this amplifier were students at Cambridge University and they manufactured these from kits of components in their student bedrooms. The initial run was planned to be 50 units but they went on to produce 33,000 and really founded Arkham as we know it today. Although this unit looks rather old and obviously with a wooden case, it's quite typical of a 1970s design, it does have some features which can be traced directly in lineage to today's products. For example, the front panel is rather long and rather narrow and has a very clean and easy to understand layout. As you can see, there are a set of tone controls and a balance control. When this amplifier was built, it was not usual for audiophile quality amplifiers to have these type of controls because it was felt that they degraded the sound quality. However, John and Chris decided that most people in Europe who would be living in small rooms with a lot of furniture would need to be able to adjust the sound slightly and therefore they decided to include these controls. In the modern RCAM equipment, we still offer tone and balance controls, but in these days, we also provide a switch so that you can disable them. If you prefer the audiophile quality sound without the tone controls, that is now an option, which did not exist in 1976. Here you see the modern Alpha 7 amplifier, a direct descendant of the A60, which we were just looking at. As you can see, it has tone controls, and it has a balance control. Let's just have a look at that rear panel. As you can see, there are now two sets of speaker terminals. This means that a user can run two sets of speakers in different rooms of the house. People want to do that because in modern houses, uh, it's nice to have music in more than one room, and the uh, Alpha 7 amplifier enables you to connect two pairs of speakers simultaneously, and then, by use of the speaker 2 switch, you can disable one of them. So, for example, if you had a second pair in perhaps the kitchen, you could switch them on or off when you were using that room. Just looking at the casework for one moment, we've now replaced the old wooden case of the A60 with a metal enclosure which provides much better protection from stray electromagnetic radiation. We also realise that when people are buying an amplifier, it is, after all, a piece of furniture. And so, therefore, the styling is quite important. And you can see in this new design that we have actually redesigned the front panel with a slight power bulge. This gives extra rigidity to the unit, but it also makes it look more stylish, brings it much more up to date than the previous series, and gives the impression that this is a very powerful and solidly built amplifier, which, of course, it is. The Alpha 7, which you see here, is the introductory model in a range of three amplifiers which we will be launching very shortly across the globe. Moving on now to the CD players, what we have here this morning is the Alpha 7 and Alpha 8 CD players. 
Identical on the outside, the difference between these players is really in terms of the audio processing and the electronics inside. This means that your customers can easily upgrade from Alpha 7 to Alpha 8 by simply exchanging the audio board which is located inside the unit. Again, we have completely refreshed the design of the front panel. We did this to increase the ease of use by relaying the group of uh, control buttons here by putting in a larger display with more information on it and also by using a new Sony mechanism. Just looking at the front panel layout for one moment, you can see that the display now shows all of the tracks on the disc at any one time, so you can see how many tracks are available to be played. We then have some very simple controls to enable you to step forward and backwards through the tracks. And as one steps through them, one can see that the display shows how many tracks remain to be played and erases those tracks which have already been played. The Sony mechanism, which I mentioned before, has a very fast access time, and that's one of the reasons why we chose this mechanism. With this mechanism, we also have two new functions which come with the, the Sony microcontroller, and I'd just like to take a minute to tell you what they are. Firstly, we have a function which is called AB. It can only be accessed from the remote control, and that simply enables you to select a segment between A and B in a track, and then to repeat it over and over again. Now, that may sound rather arcane, but in fact, it's very useful, for example, for musicians who want to learn a particular sequence of music to be able to program that and to have it repeated over and over again until they've been able to learn it. It does also mean that you can listen to your favourite guitar solo until you've completely driven everyone else in the house mad. The second function is a check function. Again, it can only be accessed from the remote control, but once a programme has been entered into here, it is now possible using the check function to go through that program step by step and check what has actually been programmed. That was not previously possible and we think that users will appreciate that function as well. So I think you'll agree that in refreshing the design of our entry level player we've made some significant user benefits available. Whilst we're talking about uh, PCB design, I thought it would be good to show you one of our blank PCBs. Many people do not realise that in cheaper audio products, especially from the Far East, the printed circuit boards, or the blanks such as this, are actually made from compressed paper. We feel that that is likely to degrade the audio quality of the signal, and we only specify military specification printed circuit boards such as this, which are actually made from glass fibre. So this is the highest quality PCB which one can source commercially and we feel that it makes a valuable increase in the sound quality and I'm sure that uh, you and your customers will agree when you hear the sound that the Alpha 7 and 8 series can produce. It's always a good idea to have a board such as this in the store so that you can show your customers what it looks like. It's quite solid, it's not terribly flexible and when you look at it, the detail is quite phenomenal and it's quite an impressive sales aid. If you require these, you can obtain them from our cam. Well, I hope that's given you a reasonable introduction to the new products from our cam. I'd like to thank you for coming along today, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope that I've shown you some ways in which you can increase your our cam sales and I look forward to doing a lot more business with you in the next season. Thank you very much. Presentations are an important part of this business for me as an export manager because, as you may have realised, it's quite a small department. We only have three people actually working in export and we're trying to service 45 countries. The best way to do that, from my point of view, when I want to get a complex message such as a new product range across to them, is to actually present to a group of people. And so we do try to encourage them to come in a group to the factory on a regular basis now normally that would be once every two years because that's about the time it takes for us to be able to handle a very large group of distributors. 
But in the intervening period, I go out to the markets, I travel out to the Far East, to North America, for example, and to Europe, and inevitably I'm called upon to make a presentation to a group either of distributors from different countries or to a group of dealers from one country. And so I have to be quite aware of how I'm going to tailor the presentation, either for dealers or for distributors, and because really they're at two levels, and I probably want to communicate two slightly different messages. Preparation obviously can be quite important if you want to communicate a complex message. And I try to enliven any kind of formal presentation with, for example, the use of props. I uh, have one here. A very simple prop would be a blank um, printed circuit board such as this. It gives me something to wave around which looks visually much more appealing when I'm talking to people. It catches their attention, focuses them on what I'm saying about this particular product. And it's very simple. It packs flat into my travelling case when I'm going abroad. So it's a convenient and easy prop to take. Obviously, if I had to take something like this with me, it would be much more difficult. And in reality, I probably could achieve the same effect with a, a board such as this. I have worked off notes in the past. I try to keep them very simple and just work from cards, perhaps with a keyword on, because I find that if I'm trying to read notes, I get lost, I can't find my place in the notes, or I deviate from the script which I've already prepared, and then I can't find the next key topic. So I prefer just to have the, the important topics highlighted on a small piece of card, perhaps 10 centimetres by 5, um, in a nice big block typeface that I can easily read at a distance. Um, if I'm using a lectern for a presentation, which has happened, I've given lectures before in proper lecture theatres around the world, and then it's quite nice to have the cards spread out on the lectern so I can just glance down, pick up the keyword, and that's an aid memoir then I should move on to the next topic. Of course, there are always good and bad presentations, and you always feel that whether a presentation will be enjoyable or not is determined very much by the reaction of the audience. The worst possible type of presentation is where you get zero reaction. You are presenting what you th feel is good quality material in a cogent and well thought out manner, but you're getting no reaction from the audience at all. And that could be because they're either bored or they don't understand what you're saying, which could be a serious problem in overseas markets especially. Um, or their attention has been distracted by something else. And I have had that happen on occasion. It, it's most off-putting because you don't know what you should be doing to modify your presentation to regain their attention. And um, I remember a notable presentation I gave in Poland where most of the audience, I would say at least 75% of them, were actually drunk at the time uh, because they'd just come from a departmental party and they were not at all interested in what I had to say, but they had been told by their boss that they had to come to the presentation, and that's really presents as hell. It's a complete nightmare. It's very, very difficult to deal with, and I just had to get through it the best as I, I could. On the other hand, I've had some extremely good presentations where I've had tremendous reaction from the audience, lots of feedback, lots of questions, really interested in what's going on, really want to know about the product or the service, and a tremendous rapport building up but both ways between the presenter and the audience and with their feedback between the audience and the presenter on behalf of the company as well. I think it's important to have a structure and to be very clear in your mind about the sequence in which you're going to go through. And the one tip I can give to businessmen who perhaps are not familiar with presenting to large groups of people or just don't do that many presentations is try and work it up so that you can remember the order in which the elements come and if it helps, try and always start off with the same opening phrase. And the phrase which I tend to use is, what we have here today, ladies and gentlemen, is. And that phrase I've been using for 10 years now, ever since I first started presenting in a sales environment. And I find it just gears me up into the mode of thinking through the key elements that I want to get across in the presentation. It tells them why I'm here. 
It introduces the subject or the product that I'm going to talk about and it establishes the relationship between them and me. And it's a very simple phrase for me to remember. And it, it puts me at ease and I think it helps to put them at ease as well. And I would say that's a good tip.